Hi, good morning, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us uh, for this special live taping of the Texas Tribune Tribcast. Uh, if you aren't a routine listener of the Tribcast, I hope you will be. It's our um, kind of occasionally rough and tumble political podcast that we host every week. We also generally stream it live. Uh, and if you watch along on Facebook, you can send questions our way. Uh, so this week, as Evan said, we're going to have a, an incredible conversation with two esteemed House members. Um, thank you so much for joining us. We have uh, State Representative Nicole Collier of Fort Worth. We, ha we have uh, Representative Kevin Roberts of Houston. And of course, I'm always uh, mostly uh, pleased to be joined by my boss, CEO <laughs> Evan Smith. Yeah. So, um, well, after we drill these two for a little bit, and we did choose House members today, uh, coincidentally, we didn't know the Senate was going to be the chamber that was going super late last night, so these two look quite refreshed, but after we drill the two of them for a little while and make them a little less refreshed, we're going to have uh, Executive Editor Ross Ramsey and Political Reporter Patrick Svitek join us up here uh, to talk about a few other items. So, um, as is the case with all Tribcast, you'll be able to ask questions. Please reserve them for the end. So let's get started here. Why don't the two of you start by telling us exactly what you've accomplished in the last 30 days or so? We're heading into sunny die, hopefully, uh, in the next 36 hours or so. You guys owe us that, at least. So, so tell us what you've, what you've gotten done. <laughs> Well, uh, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Sure. And uh, well, there hasn't been much that's been done. I, I feel good about being able to uh, defend and fight off some really bad bills, like the abortion affiliate bill. Uh, I feel good about the union dues bill. We had a great vote on that yesterday, uh, a test vote on that. So I feel good that we were able to defeat some bills. Uh, but I, mostly I've been playing defense this legislative session. There really wasn't anything on the call besides the sunset bill and the maternal mortality bill. Uh, that was really even necessary. Uh, so basically just playing defense. What about you? I mean, obviously there are some, you know, Governor Abbott put 20 items on the call, representative that he said were important. Um, House Republicans sort of took the baton on a handful of them. Where are you going to end up? What's the, the magic number going to be? Well, first I'm excited in the fact that my first session I get to have a special session, <laughs> so I get the full meal deal. Uh, first of all, on a personal note, I'm very excited about a bill that we passed out of the house of mine, and that's a first responder bill. That at the end of last session, as you know, we passed a first responder bill that for a first responder that passed away, their spouse would be eligible for a property tax exemption. Soon thereafter, we, I received a call from a constituent who said, thank you, Representative Roberts, but let me tell you about those of us who have lifetime disabilities. So my bill that we passed out of the House allows for first responders with lifetime disabilities, i.e. they qualify for lifetime income benefits, to be exempt from property tax. Now, now that's the good part. Yeah. The bad part is it's somewhere in the Senate. It's still currently somewhere in the Senate. I actually, right. I saw some conversations that you'd had around this particular piece of legislation as it related to the bathroom bill. Of course, I'm going to bring this back to the bathroom bill. There were folks questioning, you know, whether you were going to sign on as an author to the bathroom bill. And you said basically, no, I'm not because I really want to protect the sanctity of this other bill that's a high priority to me, correct? Well, I didn't say no, I'm not. Okay. Here's what I said. You know, sometimes being honest and honoring your word gets you in trouble, right? There shouldn't have been any confusion as it is one of the most prevalent issues from my constituents in terms of calls and surveys. I co-authored the bill during the regular session. Right. I've been known, I've, if asked, if it hits the floor, I'll vote for it. What I did say though was, I will not sign on the bill in the special session until my first responder bill gets to the House floor, and we vote it out. And true to my word, got to the House floor, we vote it out. The first thing I do, go to the clerk's office and sign on the bill. Right. So I guess folks yeah. aren't used to honoring your word because it <laughs> confused a lot of folks. Well, this is, this is politics. Look, look I mean, the, the, the frame at the beginning of this session was uh, presented to us in the form of the two buttons. On the one hand, sunset and signy die, on the other hand, 20 for 20. The reality is, Representative Collier, neither side is getting what it wanted, as, at least as it relates to those, to those buttons. You did more than some wanted, but as far as the governor's list, he's not coming anywhere close to 20 for 20. Who is going to declare victory as a result of that? I mean, really, because the frames were set up at the absolute outermost points. 
Who can say, based on what happened here, we got what we wanted? I, well, that's a good question, but I think it's changing because, as you know, the governor's been 20 for 20, and I've been seeing these pins 20 for 20 by certain um, members of the legislature on the Republican side, um, and, and they have been, you know, cheering that on. But as we go on, you start seeing your bills die, and you, you start changing the um, conversation. The other day, the governor was on TV, Inside Texas Politics, and he says, I'm 20 for 20. And then he says, well, you know, I just, the Texans deserve a vote. Well, which is it? Do we deserve a vote? Or do we, do you want to actually push those buttons and, and get You those think the yard markers have been moved in as the, oh. rea as the reality of, the, of this uh, session? Representative Roberts, would you declare victory if you were the governor? I mean, it looks like it's going to be somewhere in the vicinity of Half of his items may get through, and half may be optimistic. I think it depends on how you measure victory, and I think each person has a different perspective. Yeah. From his perspective, you know, 100% victory would be 20 for 20. I right. think he can walk away saying that we made some great headway on the 20 for 20. You know, on those, the sunny die sunset, well, part of that's true. We passed. The reason we're here actually have to be here is the sunset bills yeah. okay from my perspective if i'm here i'm going to work and work on the issues that are important to my district okay so i think it's all depend upon how you view victory what kind of grand bargain do you think we might see coming together in the next you know 24 hours or so that might uh, move the needle on property taxes on school finance you know what it changes from day to day and I can tell you this, I don't know if I'm uh, in the legislature or if I'm watching Kaiser Sose on The Usual Suspects because the plot twist and turn every day that it's like one. like an Evan Smith line. That was pretty good, I have to say. <laughs> yeah. It just twists and turns. Dennis like Bonin starts limping at the end of the session. <laughs> I, it's going to I didn't say that, but yeah. yeah. <laughs> But, but, but you, you really don't know. I mean, the reality is you don't know, because obviously we're all waiting to see, and some bills that were supposed to have been voted on were delayed, and there was a big fight over the delay, there was a big fight over amendments, but basically there is still a lot of balls in the air. Oh, yeah. And, and you think that everything is connected? Oh, it's, yeah, definitely. Yeah. I think the biggest change for me has been for 25 years in business, I've been on the inside developing strategy and moving chess pieces. Now. That's way above my pay grade now right. as a freshman, which I love being called a freshman because when you're my age, you don't often have that opportunity. I mean, what's being done behind the scenes, I can't even speak to. All I can speak to is once it gets to the floor, we'll see what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Will any of it, it does not sound like any of these negotiations are even touching on the bathroom bill at all. I mean, do you both think it's fair to say that the bathroom bill is dead for this special? I sure hope it is. I mean, really, there's no reason to even have this bill because uh, uh, there has been so much opposition. Just like you were getting support from your community, I'm getting so much opposition from mine. It's not necessary. And I'm so glad that the business community came out and, and voiced their opposition to this bill. And you know what? I, 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 can, I think what I'm seeing, because we haven't had that bill to the floor, yeah. is that the people are realizing, and me meaning the legislators are realizing, your big donors are opposed to this. And so we've got to listen to our donors. So you think as a practical matter, there's no vehicle where this thing could pop back up as an well. amendment on as an amendment on a school related bill or anything else? You, you think it is dead? You're confident that it's dead? Representative Roberts thinks it's too late. The clock has run out on those opportunities. Oh, no, I don't. You don't? Think uh, no, that? no. I think until we gavel out, anything's right. alive. But do you think, but when we were talking a little bit earlier about the possibility of amendments, I mean, do you think that there's still a chance that there will be, there could be an amendment or a deal brokered in conference? I can't speak to a deal. I mean, I think all options are still on the table. Mm -hmm. Okay, we're going to conference committee, yeah. as long as amendments are allowed. I, I mean, I think it's premature to say anything mm -hmm. is not a possibility because, you know, everything's still at, let, 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 let's come at this a different way. Do you believe in the hidden hand theory that at the end of the day, this bill was never going to pass and is not going to pass because the speaker doesn't want it to pass and that word has come down from the big office and therefore the people who control the flow of legislation, calendars and what have you, are going to smother this thing effectively at the speaker's direction. So don't even pretend that this thing is live. Do you believe in that hidden hand theory? Is that my question? Oh, absolutely. <laughs> okay. Yeah. I believe that the House is a very... Is this one? Independent like uh, body. Okay. Yeah. I can say as of right now, it's not calendared for the floor. 
it's in Cal well, I don't even know. It hasn't had a hearing. So mm, right. that's the only affirmative thing I can say. I will say this, though. Um, thank you, Nicole. Whoa, hello. There you go. I've never had a problem being heard. Um, I don't think this is an issue that's going to go away. Okay. You know, here's how I look at it. Why are we still discussing it today? You can go back whether you agree or disagree. I think it's just the reality. You go back to President Obama's executive order. Okay. It's sort of like the Pastor Protection Act. Why did we have to pass an act to protect pastors from freedom of speech in the pulpit? Well, they're guaranteed freedom of speech, but we didn't have to until they get subpoenaed for their sermons. So similar here, you know, I haven't had any calls saying that they're little boys in girls' bathrooms, okay? But I've had many calls and the 60 plus percent of the folks in our, my district believe that there's a need for it, okay? So, I mean, you can look at it from a million different directions. You know, I don't think it's dead. Any, I don't think he thinks dead till it's dead, and I think we will see it again. Do you think we'll see uh, the lieutenant governor? I mean, he's been relatively quiet on this issue in the last week or two weeks. I mean, do you think there's a possibility we're going to see some um, some moves in the final sort of 36 hours here on the bill? Mm -hmm. No, the bill is a fallacy. They make up this fear. They put this fear in people's mind that oh, you're going to get attacked. We have laws already in place. Voyeurism is against the law. There's a crime for that. If you have people going into the restroom, they're just making, what are we in Machiavelli time? I mean, saying that, oh, you people are ruling by fear now. They're putting fear in people's hearts and minds to tell them that you can be attacked, your child can be attacked. Of course you're gonna react and think that this is the best thing, but it's not. It, all it does is harm businesses and harm people and create more div division within our community. So th the bill, it needs to die. Is there any chance you're gonna come back after, uh, regardless of what happens over the next 36 hours, is there any chance the governor is going to bring you back? You think? Well, he, this is what he said. He said the the legislators got to make up their mind, and he said the House needs to act or make up their mind whether they want to stay in Austin or go home to their families. So I don't know what he, you know, I don't know what he's <laughs> going to decide. I mean, your guess is as good as mine. Representative, what do you think? I think I want to go home to my family. <laughs> He knows how to answer that question. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. <laughs> what do you think the governor is going to do? Boy, again, my pay grade's so low, I couldn't even begin to guess. Um, you know, I, I have no earthly idea, no clue. Oh. I know he can decide to do what he wants, and he can call us back, or he can decide not to call us back. Well, to save face, he's going to have to do something. I mean, he's either going to have to say the will of the House didn't, you know, the, it wasn't the will of the House to take these votes, or he's going to, in that he's done his best, or he could get pressured from the Lieutenant Governor to bring us back because those are the 2020 issues that he insisted to put on the call. So, I mean, it's going to be a, a, a political decision, you know, for the Governor to decide whether he wants to spend the taxpayer dollars to bring us back, or if he wants to just take the thir first 30 day session or these, the special session as it is. Evan, don't you think, I mean, if he gets some form of property taxes, if he gets, looks like the tree stuff was revived a little bit last night, if he gets some form of school finance, I mean, he hasn't even really been talking about the bathroom issue. I saw one, he put out a Facebook video, basically. This is he, he the governor. He the governor. Yeah. I saw him put out a Facebook video, basically sort of thanking his colleagues for, you know, considering it or for carrying it. I think he's done. I feel like if Sunset and property tax passes, he's probably going to take the win, mm -hmm. declare victory, and then, and then move on. <clears throat> the, the, the big frame around the special, I wonder if the representatives agree with this, coming into it was what's going to be different this time than the last time. There was opposition to school choice last time, there's opposition this time. There was opposition to the bathroom bill, at least in the House, to the degree that it did not make it through the process uh, uh, enough to get to a vote, and that may have been a leadership opposition as opposed to a member's opposition. Same, same, thing, same thing this time. So wouldn't you say, Representative Roberts, if the governor were to bring you back for another special or another or another, that question would have to be asked again. What is going to change? Coming into the session, I would have agreed in that I didn't really expect anything to change, at least as it relates to the House. Yep. But if you look at it, I think we've had great success in at least moving the ball forward. Okay? We've moved the ball forward on property tax reform. Okay? Be it transparency and, you know, very well, yep. you know, a rollback rate. We've moved the ball forward, at least on discussing school finance, with an opportunity now that the Senate voted out HB 21, at least to get to the table 
and conference committee. We've moved forward on a number of issues. I think, what, three pro-life issues are on the governor's desk. Mail-in ballot fraud, uh, maternal mortality. So the ball has moved forward. Now, no one ever gets, I mean, Evan, you might in your marriage, but you know, there's a saying called compromise. Yeah, I'm gonna... Okay. <laughs> and you know, I'm glad to see that we actually, both sides, are at least moving towards the middle and trying to Oh, I would disagree progress. with that. We were nowhere near where you guys are on these issues. In fact, we were shot down time after time on, on these uh, insurance, uh, separate insurance for abortion uh, provide, uh, coverage for, for women. So uh, I don't think that we were close to just anything. In fact, we get ram everything gets rammed down our throat and we don't have much of a say. And I'm, I'm talking about the 55 Democrats uh, when we, we're talking about legislation. I mean, it sounds like a compromise, but maybe it's a compromise within the Republican Party themselves uh, from one to the other, but it just has, it's been very uh, divisive, divisive the, during the whole session. Right, that compromise is largely been compromised between the House and the Senate versus, right. <laughs> versus compromise between Republicans. Can, and can I ask Representative Roberts' yeah. question before we switch things out? So on this question of compromise between Republicans, I need to ask you about the Republican caucus meeting that's happening on Thursday that has been requested to discuss the process of choosing a speaker. Obviously, all eyes in the Capitol are on this meeting because this is perceived to be an attempt to get Speaker Strauss out of the chair and that possibly by making it so that the caucus determines the speaker, the number of votes you would need to have a candidate other than the speaker uh, goes down significantly. What are you going to do personally in that meeting? Where, where, where are you, Representative Roberts, on the question of how the speaker should be chosen? Sure. Let me first say, Nicole, I listen to you all the time. I, and Kevin does. And He's very nice. He, he put that gavel down when I asked him yesterday. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> I, I do. Yes, ma'am. Well. Um, Evan, in response to your question, I've attended every Republican caucus meeting. Okay. I plan to attend Thursday yep. uh, because when I go back home and I'm asked the question, I want to be able to say, here's what took place. Here's the deal, though. As I understand the rules, there has to be a 15-day notification as it relates to any procedural change. So I'm not seeing anything earth shattering occurring, but again, I have no clue what the topic is going to be. I just know I go to Republican caucus meetings and I'll go there and I'll will, let you. Will, will you commit to not having the speaker chosen in the Republican caucus, but having it be chosen by the full membership? Until I hear, I mean, I don't know what I'd be committing even to. So, I mean, more broadly, how do the two of you think Speaker Strauss comes out of this special session? How does he come out? Politically. Yeah. I mean, I think that he, the body, had independence, and he allows us to have our voice and allows us to have our votes. So I don't think special session has been any different than it is, um, was during the regular. Here's the difference between the House. I'm in unincorporated Houston, okay? That's a totally different world than the representatives who represent urban counties or suburban counties. And then we have our rural friends, okay? I heard he's the only one that has filed to run. As I've said for a million years, I will look at all the available options of those who are running, right. and I will make the best decision of the most conservative, viable candidate that allows me to represent my district. Representative, should the Democrats line up behind the speaker again? Well, a lot of them have. I have. Uh, he's been very strong about uh, his conviction on uh, the bathroom bill. He's been very strong on his conviction about vouchers. And these are issues that are important uh, in my party. And he's, he's stayed strong with that. And he kept that, um, you know, he was able to regulate the, area, the floor uh, and keep everybody's tempers in line pretty much. So I feel like he's been a strong leader in terms of those issues. And I, I haven't seen anybody come forward that I would change my mind for. We're going to do a quick uh, seating change here. And if you all will stick close by, we're going to keep you around for the Q&A. Yep. Ross Let's and Give Patrick. these guys a hand. Yes. Thank you. Finally, we're joined by people who actually know stuff. Yes, right? exactly. Well, one. 
<laughs> yes, one at least. All right, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Well, why don't we start by the two of you giving us your sense of the big winners and big losers of the special mm -hmm. legislative session? I think everyone can maybe say that they won at this one. <laughs> we'll uh, talk us through that. all over. Um, you know, I think the, the big question is how Abbott's going to define success. Obviously, it's fair to judge him, I think, by the, the 20 for 20 uh, benchmark or checkpoint that he put out at the beginning. But obviously, a lot of people did not expect, including I think himself privately, did not expect to get all the way to, to 20. And so it's a matter of um, not only how many items short of 20 does he get, but what exactly are those items. And I think right now, and this is an outstanding issue, is uh, what he's going to get on property taxes and what he's going to get on school finance. Um, both yes, those issues. Yes, you were issues. up very late writing about those right. things. Right. Yeah. Um, <laughs> property taxes, you know, has advanced, has officially advanced to a conference committee. Um, mm -hmm. School finance, I think, is moving toward a conference committee. Um, and I think, you know, it's just going to, it's, uh, I think Abbott's top priority is property taxes. Um, but he said we, publicly, that's my he's, top he's priority. He's all but said that publicly. Right. And so he's, I think he, he and his office are intensely focused on that in the home stretch. Uh, but we have the situation now, obviously, where property taxes is almost kind of, I, I think, or at least it, as of over the weekend, it was kind of tied to school finance. And right. so you may not see movement on one without the other. Doesn't it look good, though? I mean, if Patrick is right that school finance and property tax are the things we have to get for the right. governor to declare victory, we're headed in the right direction. Yeah, that's the, the grand, that's the grand bargain them, at the right? end of this thing. And you right. know, they've got them all into kind of the penultimate position. So they're all ready to vote on if they can cut a deal. And it's, you know, all of those components together from the School Finance Commission to the property tax bill to yeah. the school finance bill that the House considers, the House leadership considers its property tax bill. And if you can make all of those pieces right. fit together well enough that uh, they all walk out, I, I think it's a win. I think, you know, if Strauss can walk out of here and say, I called a special session, we took care of the thing we had to do, we got a school finance bill, right. we got property tax, and we got some other things, I think he can fly that flag and salute it. I think for Strauss, Strauss's win is there's no bathroom bill. Patrick's win is the property tax bill. So I think everybody walks out of here with something to brag about. But what does Patrick do about the bathroom fallout? Well, I think, you know, the bathroom bill as a political matter is more useful in some ways as a failed bill. You know, it's more useful to go forward and say, send me more troops. I need more people. Send me, you know, that's a fundraising thing now for both sides. You know, Strauss goes out and says, send me more people. Patrick goes out and says, send me more people. Um, you know, I think in a political sense that works. In a policy sense, you right. know, obviously it's a win for Strauss for stopping the bill and a, and a loss for Patrick. But, you know, I think this was really about culture wars and politics more than it was about policy in the first place. The, the cynical view in response, not so much to Ross, but to Patrick's uh, point on... You're getting the, the cynical view. On <laughs> property tax and school finances, it's, property, it's a property tax bill where no one actually gets any property tax relief. And it's a school finance bill where the schools don't actually get more money. Well, you make right? a property it's, it's tax like, relief. It's like it's the Seinfeld special session. It's right. a special session about nothing, basically, right? right? As they say. I mean, in the end, Abbott may win, Patrick may win, Strauss may win. The question is whether Texas wins. Well, if you take that, pat if you take that property tax bill apart, it's a 4 or 6% limit on how much you can raise property taxes in 38 to 44 cities in mm -hmm. the state and something like 50 of the 254 counties. It's a very limited bill. It's yeah. a, you know, it's a future thing. It's not going to cut your property taxes now. It may limit their ability in those big places to raise your property taxes later. It's kind of a nothing burger. So you think they should have expanded property taxes to everybody, not just to the limited number I, you've discussed? I have no opinion on it. I'm just saying, you know, this, I'm an entomologist. I'm you were just watching how the bugs Stickland go. On I'm not telling the bugs where to go. Right, okay. I mean, the funny thing about this special session is, like, these are issues, candidly, that during a regular session might have gotten, you know, a couple of paragraph mentions at the bottom of the story. Well, and here and we are having an entire special right. session on them. Right. And, you know, people were skeptical of this talking point, but I think that will be one of the talking points coming out of the session. We've already seen that from some of the state leaders is, you know, hey, maybe we didn't, you know, get, go 20 for 20, but at least we came into this <laughs> session and there was a brighter spotlight than ever on some of these very important issues, um, according to the people who, who put them on the agenda. And so I mean, that may be, I imagine that's going to be part of the post-session mm -hmm. uh, messaging, which is at least there was this spotlight on them, right. and at least we got to see where everyone, at Do, least when it got to the floor. There's you know, a legitimate... There's a legitimate question, if you're a normal human, what did they do for me during this special <laughs> session? How did my life change while the legis because of what the legislature did? And in terms of you know, tangible things where you walk out and say, I got this, I got this, I got this, it's a pretty short list. But for 
political humans. Uh, yeah. This is, you know, this has been an important special session in some ways. The, the conservative uh, caucus, the Freedom Caucus in the House, had a pretty good regular session in the sense that the 60, the, 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 the 83 bent in the direction more often than not of the 12, right? That they actually had a disproportionate influence right. on the way the Republican Party ran in the House. My perception is that the Freedom Caucus did not have a good special session. Is that your read too? Well, I think a lot of what happened in the special session was, you know, everybody adjusts. This is cat and mouse. And, and the Freedom Caucus raised its game considerably during the regular session. You know, they took some, you know, we saw the Democrats do this years ago when Trey Martinez Fisher and, and Jim Dunham and all of those folks were, Yvonne Davis, all of those folks were upping the game there. Freedom Caucus did that. The cat watched and learned some things and figured out how to shut them down. We saw that with the uh, vote, the move to call the question. Was that just yesterday? That was just yesterday. It seems like a week ago. Uh, right. You know, some maneuvers like that where they figured out how to get around them and they've been boxed a little bit during the special. Do you expect to see anything from Dan Patrick on the bathroom bill in the next 24 hours? Sure. Um, you're going to send up a flare that says, you know, the reason this failed is because of, you know, some whatever they want to call them, whatever name they put on it. You know, we need more people like us and we've got a primary election ahead in which we can change the composition of the Texas legislature and get the kind of legislation that we want. You, I, think, you, it's, know, you think it's dead? I think it's dead. I think, you know, it's, it's not, it never got referred to committee in the House, ne much less heard, much less kicked out. I mean, during the regular session, though, there was some late night hearing, I think, where Senator Kolkhorst, you know, tried to tack it on as an amendment, like at one or two in the morning. Uh, there, will there be some funny business? And We're we get very to close the to the point where that thing, you know, just can't move. The last time you can have a calendar set for tomorrow, it's a 24-hour layout, so, you know, I think sometime this morning is the last time the calendars committee can set something for the House. It would have to come in as a miracle pass in a conference committee, and then you'd have to get it, you know, through all the Byzantine parliamentary stuff. I think it's dead. To, Ro to Ross's point, this does become a political issue in the primary. They probably come after Cook, right, as the chair of state affairs, or Hunter as the chair of calendars for somehow being complicit with the speaker and killing this thing. I imagine it's an issue in primaries where it directly makes sense. Obviously, Cook, because he's the, the chairman of the state affairs committee, that could be an issue in that race. Um, but going back to the, the, the Dan Patrick question, my, yeah. my read on this could be totally wrong, but it seems to be a little different uh, in the final days of the special versus the final days of the regular session, which is, by all appearances, a lot of people are still at the table right now and negotiations are still going on. Right. Based on the reporting we've done, you know, at the end of the regular session, that final week, things were kind of pretty much, had, people had stopped talking, I think. Yeah, nobody was um, even speaking least, to each other. You know, <laughs> yeah. No closures. We did a review right. of the governor's schedule in that final week and he wasn't really meeting with, with any of the legislative players. So it seems like everyone is still at the table who needs to be at the table for things to get done at, toward the end of the special session. Mm -hmm. And that may be why there's less of an incentive, even for someone like Dan Patrick, to go out and, and have a, a news conference and you know, bemoan the, the death of the, the bathroom bill, for example. So. Right. Uh, well, I do want to talk for a couple minutes here about uh, Texas A&M has been in the headlines a lot. It's all over our website in the last um, 48 hours in the aftermath of Charlottesville. Uh, initially, it was that on September 11th, Texas A&M was going to be, you know, home to a uh, an alt-right. Sure, uh, they like the home yeah, to. Yeah, home to, <laughs> right, a white supremacist rally uh, protest. And then, uh, I guess, John Sharp, Chancellor, came out yesterday and said, Thanks, but no thanks? Right, not in my house. Um, you know, I think there's going to be a fight here. You know, this is obviously, you know, from one side, well, I guess from both sides, this is a free speech thing and a, and a provocation thing. Sharp said we don't have the security for this. The cops say we can't secure the campus. This is a bad idea. Let's don't have this thing at a and I think the other side, uh, they've already indicated that they're going to sue and say, you know, we have a free speech right to do this and to do it at a and &M. I don't think it's over yet, but I think, you know, this is um, developing into, you know, the flashpoint maybe in court. Are you, of, are you surprised this is, the, at Texas a this is the end? I, I, I thought A&M wouldn't have the ability to not have this rally. I don't, I don't think, I'm not sure they do have the I, ability I'm, not I'm, to I'm have with the Emily. Rally. I'm not sure that they can actually stop this rally, but they can, you know, raise the profile of their opposition to having an event like this. And, you know, when you do have an event like this after a big court fight, it, it could be a very different event than would have taken place otherwise. I mean, you could have had another Charlottesville. I think ramping it up like this is probably going to make it a very high profile sort of, you know, the event itself may be. Um, 
Right. I mean, you see, kind of you know, the, the Ku Klux Klan does stuff like this, you know, all over the country. I mean, I don't, I feel like this has been litigated before. I'm, I'd be really curious for the legal community to sort of weigh in and say, like, what can or, or can't we stop here? Right. You can imagine this is a fight the ACLU is not going to particularly enjoy having to have. Well, and it's going to fit on, into... On, beha on behalf of Richard Spencer. Right. right. Well, and it's going to, and it's going to fit into this whole bigger thing that's been going on for a couple of years now on who gets to appear on campus, when... Mm -hmm. Do they get to appear on campus? What's offensive? What's educational? You know, what's the spectrum of free speech that's allowed on a campus, mm -hmm. particularly a public university campus? Um, I, you know, I think Sharp may be on the politically right side of this, but um, as a policy matter or a constitutional matter, I think he's probably going to lose. Mm -hmm. What's the, the political conversation been around this? I mean, obviously, after you know, President Trump sort of uh, equivocated in his, in his public statements on this, how have we seen Texas officials respond and, and how strongly and in what kind of language? I don't think it's been much of a political matter in Texas, mm -hmm. at least compared to you know what happened with Trump over the weekend. I think right. Republicans and Democrats and like in Texas have been pretty unequivocal in, in condemning this and calling it uh, what it is. I mean, you even, uh, I mean, <laughs> this sounds cynical, but you know, to some people, it was a surprise, for example, that Ted Cruz came out as uh, strongly as he did against mm -hmm. this on on Saturday and early, if only I mean, because yeah. he is you know since Trump was elected, tried to avoid outflanking him on any issue or trying to avoid appearing at odds with him on any issue. And yet he came out, you know, hours after Trump was criticized for being, uh, you know, for insufficiently condemning this violence. Cruz came out and said, we need a, a federal investigation or a Department of Justice, Justice investigation. Uh, but, you know, I think in, in Texas it's been Wrote the, the reaction's been relatively uh, yeah. non-controversial because it's been the right reaction. And you had something of a kumbaya moment. Let's give the legislature credit yesterday. There was uni unanimity on the floor of the House yesterday, Republicans and Democrats. And in the Senate. Yeah, and in Evan's the Senate. Giving you credit. There was, and there was actually, and, there was, and I think there was real emotion in the Senate, particularly along with the House over this. And, you know, you had a number of people on both sides talking about if there is this rally, we're going to go, we're going to stand strong. Yeah, right. Shortner was saying, yeah, United against this saying. prominent alumnus of Texas A&M mm -hmm. was going to go to the rally and be a, a voice of opposition to it. Now there's not going to be a rally, at least it appears, for the right. mm -hmm. in the short term. But you know, whatever there, whatever disagreement there may have been at the federal level, you know, nothing like that at all. Right. Although I, do, I still think this First Amendment fight is going to sort of spill over into the political realm. I mean, I saw some, you know, a Twitter war on yesterday, uh, yesterday uh, between Tony McDonald of Empower Texans and Jason Vialba, state rep, arguing over, you know, whether it was constitutional or not for them to... Right. We ran they, out of popcorn at my house. It <laughs> got pretty nasty. Yeah. Yes. Right. So, uh, so I think, anyway, I think this political conversation is probably not over. But, um, all right, well, let's move out of College Station and into the sort of cross state tour uh, that Congressman Beto O'Rourke has been taking in his uh, bid to attempt to unseat Ted Cruz. Patrick, what's his strategy right now? His strategy is, is what the strategy should be right now for someone who has as, as long of a shot at this uh, race that he does, which is work really hard, be everywhere, and do it as, as, as early as possible. Um, you know, what we first reported, you know, is that he is going to be on the road by for all of August, it's going to be a totally in total, I think, a 34-day tour of the state. He's not going home to El Paso until August 31st, which is, you know, certainly a striking amount of time. Um, but again, you know, what, like I said, it, it's what he needs to do uh, to, you know, you know, come within, you know, having a chance of, of, of unseating Ted Cruz. Yeah, flashback six years. You know, there was a, a nobody candidate running against the wealthy and powerful David Dewhurst, and he went to every Rotary Club. This is Ted Cruz. Mm -hmm. He went to every Rotary Club. He went to every place where there were three people right. eating chicken to talk to him, and did it, and did it, and did it, and did it, and nothing became something. And, you know, Beto's trying to go all Ted Cruz on him. The difference is that when Ted Cruz won that primary, there were Republican voters waiting to support him in the fall. The problem, obviously, for Beto O'Rourke or for any other Democrat, no matter how many days he spends in places where Democrats typically don't win elections, like Lubbock, or Amarillo, or what have you, is he gets out of a primary. Presumably, he's the only candidate in that race, but let's assume he has to win a nominal primary to be the Democratic nominee. He starts off probably at a 10 to 15 point disadvantage going into a fall election against Cruz. And so he's really got to hope for some magic to happen, change the conversation, some kind of national Republican collapse that bleeds into Texas in order for him to be competitive. Um, right. I mean, thir 34 days on the road is a great strategy. He ought to be doing that, and he ought to be hitting him where they ain't in sports terms. That's how you're going to, you're only, that's the only way you're going to change this. But it's still an enormously uphill battle for him, right? Right. How do you hit them where they ain't in Texas? 
Well, I think you have to go to places where people typically don't see Democratic candidates. Look, Governor Abbott deserved credit and found success in traveling as a candidate for governor last time to places where Republican candidates typically don't go looking for votes. His percentage of the Latino vote in the right. last election was in part a byproduct of his going to Latino communities that traditionally voted Democratic and asking to be considered in the last election, and he had some success in doing that. Oh. It doesn't hurt O'Rourke to go to places like Lubbock or Amarillo. They can't do worse there. He just has to open the box so there's an alternative if something falls into place. If this is a really bad midterm for Republicans because of Trump, if the antipathy to Ted Cruz is sufficiently high for people to start looking around, you know, if um, Ted Cruz makes a mistake, Beto O'Rourke has to have himself in a position where everybody yeah. goes, well, at least we've got this other option. Mm -hmm. Right now, he's unknown. So, you know, a tour like this raises his profile. He's got, you know, the first $5 million in a statewide campaign in Texas is, here's my name. And he's buying, you know, yeah. with sweat equity, some of that first $5 million. And the conversation that you're now hearing in the press about where's the Democratic candidate for governor and where are the Democratic candidates for these other races is right. in part the warm body theory. You can't beat somebody with nobody. Right. You, better to beat somebody with somebody, with a real somebody, as opposed to a fake somebody. And that's why if, if these elections all of a sudden become competitive because the national environment for Republicans were to change and were to bleed down into Texas, you've got to have somebody in those races. Right now, O'Rourke is the only named candidate running for any of those seats that are on ballot. And how is O'Rourke navigating his sort of newfound friendship with, uh, with Republican Will Hurd? Uh, you know, they took this sort of cross-country road trip, stopping at a lot of DQs along the way. H how does he balance this when, you know, when O'Rourke's party is obviously trying aggressively to, to unseat Will Hurd? Yeah, this is kind of an angle that hasn't, I think, gotten all the way to the surface yet, but you start seeing it when you follow their events. You know, O'Rourke at a few events has been questioned by audience members about why he's uh, you know, as people say, uh, you know, working to make Will Hurd look cool when we're trying to <laughs> unseat Will Hurd. You know, these are just Democratic activists who are in the San Antonio area or whatever. They're in that congressional district. They've, you know, worked multiple cycles probably to try to unseat Will Hurd, who actually just wrapped up his own town hall tour right. of, uh, you know, did six days, 20 town halls. That actually was a DQ tour, I at think. DQs, right. yeah. Right. DC to DQ, right? Right. <laughs> right. right. Not a um, bad choice. And so we haven't seen the storyline emerge too much quite yet, but we've been following it. It raises some interesting questions down the line for 2018 for the, the state party, which is you know going to be uh, state party and national parties can be focused on unseating those three Republican congressional incumbents, mm -hmm. Pete Sessions, John Culberson, and Will Hurd. And uh, you know Beto O'Rourke is going to be effectively the top of the ticket for the Democrats in, in Texas, and I imagine he's gonna, they're going to look to him to maybe do some kind of coordinated events where he you know may end up at a a rally in San Antonio where he's campaigning with a Democratic nominee to unseat. Uh, well, Hurd. it'll be news if he doesn't endorse the Democrat in that race because mm -hmm. of his bestie running as a Republican, right? Right, right. and he's, he's told me, right. he told, Beto told me uh, at the you know, beginning of this, or beginning of July, that he doesn't plan to get involved in efforts to unseat Hurd, which is something that the party oh, probably doesn't oh, want right. to hear. I mean, that's going <laughs> to infuriate them. If the top, I just, I don't understand it, it how It just he, shows the balance act that he has and he tries to, you know, project this image I as think a, the a activists are going to be. I think the activists are irritated at both of them. But I think, you know, the, the play here is, you know, everybody else who's not an activist is looking at this and going, finally, somebody's talking to each other. Right, you know, I, I right. Think, Representative Roberts was talking about compromise. I think, so, yeah. I think they get as much positive or more positive bounce out of this than they get negative bounce. Oh, You're really talking bad. about them. I think the two of right? them get more positive bounce. Right, I think and I think, it, I think you know, not great for Pete Gallego. As, as irritating as this might be to other Democrats on one hand and Republicans on the other hand, it's beneficial to the two candidates who are doing it, and that's why they're doing it. Uh, well, let's talk about another Democrat who may be sort of plotting his political course. I mean, we, we don't have other sort of big names at top tickets, but what's, what's Julian Castro's plan? He's got a political action committee. What's it, what is he thinking? Yeah, he and his supporters or allies, whatever you want to call them, uh, you know, operatives close to him uh, filed paperwork, I believe, last week to set up kind of a con you know, the beginnings of what looks like a, a constellation of new political groups uh, to help him you know, lay the groundwork potentially for a 2020 presidential run. Um, these are the kind of you know groups that you would use to support uh, you know candidates at every level across the country over the next two two and a half three years, um, and then you could you know turn around and, and you know kind of cash those chits in when you run for president. Basically, I mean, um, obviously there are a lot of names right now in the mix for the the Democratic primary field in 2020, but he is definitely I think ahead of the curve in terms of actually taking a step to setting up this kind of group. I don't think 
a lot of the other 2020 people um, have done this yet, or maybe they, you know, they already have this, but have not done this yet within the context of the upcoming election cycle. Mm -hmm. Evan, you've obviously spent a lot of time on stage with him or having conversations with him. What's your he, read he's on He's never this? denied, although he's been asked directly, he's never been denied, he's never denied that he's interested in 2020. He said he'll basically consider that option when it, you know, when, when, when the time comes. Uh, and as Patrick says, he, he's hardly the only person to set up such a, a, a committee to raise money that would allow him to travel Right. would allow him to give money to other <clears throat> campaigns, to build name ID, and to collect chits. Um, an example would be uh, Governor Steve Bullock of Montana, who has announced such a, an effort probably a month or two ago. In fact, he'll be at the Texas Tribune Festival in part because um, he is a likely candidate for president in 2020. Montana's just not that big a base. <laughs> well, Montana's about as big as Waco, right? I mean, right. from a population standpoint. But, um, but, 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 you know, it's a red state Democrat who's had some success and could possibly teach other Democrats in red states how to, you know, how to get excited and enthusiastic about the party. Look, uh, we may be nostalgic for the relatively small number of Republicans who ran last time when we get into the Democratic primary this time. I mean, you could, you could have... 30 Democrats at all levels, you know, Washington types, governors, congressmen. You got a couple of mayors, Garcetti in Los Angeles and Landro in New Orleans, among others, who've talked about running. I mean, you've got a whole bunch of people running at all levels, and there may be one candidate for president among the Democrats for every one of us in this room before this is over. And I, I think, in, in, this is an original thought, another reporter I think pointed this out on Twitter, yeah. but it's got to be cold comfort to Texas Democrats who. A lot of them probably wanted to see Julian Castro or a Castro run statewide, statewide. Right. Right. to see right. him instead taking a step toward, you know, poten potentially jumping into this scrum for 2020. Right. right. Yeah. Maybe easier to beat Steve Bullock than Greg Abbott. Right. Yeah. Right. At the end of this, we're going to look up and say, you know, how did Beto O'Rourke either? How did Beto O'Rourke know that he lucked out and he got into office? Or we're going to be saying, you know, the Democrats hit 40 percent or 38 percent again. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the Castros and people situated like that are either going to look really smart or really stupid. The bet right now is that things will go like they have gone. Mm -hmm. Well, if you want to look really smart or really stupid, we would love for you to send questions our way, mostly smart. We also have our two lawmakers here who will have uh, a mic available to them, I hope, yes, uh, to answer questions. So um, raise your hand and uh, throw in. We'd love to hear from you. Otherwise, I'm going to call on Tyler Norris. <laughs> Ma'am. Uh, good morning. Thank you for being here. Uh, after the events of uh, last weekend, and you know the accent is French, so we'll set the tone for that. Uh, what is your position as far as revisiting the signage and monuments in the city that are glorifying certain individuals from times that represent values that we no longer embrace? Mm -hmm. I, think, I think this is actually a good one for the lawmakers. There have been lots of conversations around the Confederate monuments on the state capitol grounds, on the UT campus. What do you all think? Well, I think that we need to come into the 21st century and, and acknowledge that hate is evil and that, you know, everyone's equal. And, and um, you know, I heard something from Jeff Sessions. They, he, he, he said something about he was disappointed that people were ignoring history and wanting to remove these monuments. And I, I'm not sure too many people who are proud of that history. To me, it seems like that would be the logical step is to remove that so that you don't perpetuate the uh, concept of hate by every time you look at it. So to me, as a state, we need to make sure that we remove these, these uh, monuments that you know, glorify slavery or glorify um, um, you know, harsh treatment of women. So we need to make sure that we are promoting positive energy and positive uh, futures for everyone instead of having those monuments there. Okay. First of all, I thought you were from West Texas for a minute with that <laughs> accent. Um, first of all, let me say, I will never, have never condone hate speech or the hate actions that are occurring. You know, it's a sad state to me, truthfully. I mean, we had a young lady uh, from Houston that attends college up there who was actually injured um, by the gentleman who drove the vehicle, okay? Um, to me, it's a sad state that monuments are creating this type of hate, okay? And I think we need to change the entire rhetoric. I mean, I, Ross and I actually were born in the same town. We grew up in Amarillo, Texas. 
I went to Tascosa. Our mascot was the Tascosa Rebels, okay? We never had hate speech, and we never had fights over the fact that the rebel was our mascot, okay? We have to come above that as a nation, and as leaders, we have to set the stage, okay? Because when our youth, I'm a, I'm a guy who loves kids, okay? Coach debate, um, I can't say what I normally say because Holly wouldn't be happy. Love kids, tolerate adults. Oh, <laughs> guess I said it. Um, but we have to be the model for kids growing up now for the future because they are our future, okay? And I think a lot of what we're seeing is because of what we're portraying, okay? You know, I'm a person of faith. We are all created in God's image. So do you support the removal of monuments? Do I support the, no. Okay, I don't support the removal of monuments because at the end of the day, I think that's just an excuse for some of the actions that are occurring. I don't, I also don't agree with using them to spur hate speech. Okay. Others. Other yes, questions? Sir. Guy right here and then. Sir. I'm still working on where the question is here, but I heard Ross almost say that sometimes incumbents can crash and burn, and I heard Evans say you can't beat somebody with nobody. We were recently reminded that uh, Texas governor uh, incumbents used to lose. Uh, I don't know if they are anymore, but I mean, what, where am I between what you guys were saying and whether it's a, a Republican president or some of the more Texas uh, campaigns? Are we going to see incumbents lose again? What does it take? You know, in Texas, you've got to have a combination of, you know, a Democratic, somebody, ha you have to have a really good candidate and you have to have probably a fumble or an assumption of victory at the top. Look at when Bill Clements beat John Hill in, um, 1978, you know, John Hill was measuring curtains for the, literally, measuring curtains for the mansion. They thought they had it in the bag. This is a democratic state. We're not gonna get beat by some Republican. Bill Clements ran a really good campaign. John Hill went to sleep. They got a surprise. You've gotta have some combination of a bad Republican environment, a mediocre campaign from the Republican incumbent or some distaste for the Republican incumbent and a Democrat who's in position to take advantage of that. Um, so, you know, it kind of incorporates what Evan was saying, what I was saying. Somebody's got to be president, and you've got to have some deficiency in the incumbent or the incumbent party to, to turn things over. And it always, you know, the pendulum goes back and forth. I just don't know, we don't know when it's going to do it. Last time a Democrat was elected statewide in Texas, my colleague here was home uh, uh, waiting to go to preschool, I think. Um, <laughs> So that's 20, I was barely born, I think. 23 years that, old, yeah. barely, no, alive, but barely, right. 20, 23 years ago was the last time a Democrat was elected statewide in Texas. Um, Greg Abbott's got $41 million in the bank. He's got a political operation that certainly- Which is less well, than Tony Sanchez. It, it is, but he has, he has a hell of a lot of money at his disposal. He'll have as much right. as he needs. He has a political operation that frankly probably rivals any that we've seen on either side in the last number of political cycles. Now, I think the AP's characterization this last week of the Democrats' situation and the governor's race as a new low is factually false on its face. At this point, three years ago, Wendy Davis was not yet in the race. At this point, seven years ago, Bill White was not yet in the race. Democrats still have time to get a candidate. It is also true, though, that both Wendy Davis and Bill White were presumed to be running, even though they hadn't gotten in the race by this time, three years ago and seven years ago, and yet there's no comparable person who is the obvious emerging candidate to run for governor this time. Now, a lot can change. You know, the news cycle that we've gotten used to over the last six months, where literally you can't focus on any one thing for more than five minutes, because in five minutes something else happens and it's right. sort of at breakneck speed, the same could potentially apply politically. We may be sitting here a month from now saying, God, a month ago we thought there was no race for governor, and look what's happened all of a sudden. But the, the drum beats at this point don't point to this being a competitive cycle. They just don't. Anything can change. Don't know. Questions? Yes, sir. Charlie. 
Do you all think we're going to see any political backlash against Representative Fallon um, after what happened in Charlottesville this weekend from the regular session where he filed the bill limiting the liability of drivers who hit protesters? I think this is going to fizzle out. For those of you who aren't familiar with this legislation, basically he passed legislation or he proposed Attempted. legislation uh, that would have, you know, protected drivers who bumped into people during protests. Uh, and obviously, in light of what happened in Charlottesville, this there was new life breathed into it. There was, a, I think, a Dallas Morning News story. A lot of people criticizing him for that legislation and saying you should back away from your support of that legislation. He basically came out swinging yesterday and said that is not even close to what my legislation would have protected. You know, it's totally different. These are apples and oranges. I think it was a good headline um, and sort of a juicy headline on the day after a, a major tragedy. But I think this is they, there is enough sort of space between the, the meaning behind this, this legislation that it will fizzle out. Yeah, the asterisk on this is that Fallon's not running for re-election. He's going to run against Craig Estes for Senate. And, you know, I think Craig Estes will probably do a mailer with just that headline on it. Um, and, you know, if it was a regular race, just a re-election race, I think he'd be fine. Uh, I think, you know, I'm not sure it's going to affect a Senate race one way or the other, um, but I'm sure Estes will have it in a, in a folder somewhere. Can, can we come back to the previous question? It occurs to me with our representatives here. Representative Collier, who should your party's candidate for governor be? <laughs> Don't you wish he had? <laughs> he saved that for you. I will reserve comment. <laughs> Do you have, a, you have somebody you're trying to get to run? I would have loved to see Beto O'Rourke change his mind and run for that, but uh, yeah. you know, I don't know. I think that Castro, Julian Castro, is a cal he takes calculated risk, and I think that he, you know, observes the climate and his uh, options, and so I'm not sure if he would jump into a race like that. Right. Um, so, I mean, I've heard names, uh, whether they're viable ca candidates. I, I don't, I don't believe in just running anybody. I think that we need somebody who has at least some experience, because you see what happens when you run somebody who has no experience in the political realm with Trump. Yeah, you so, win. <laughs> well, you win and you, 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 you really bring out hate. I mean, basically, I mean, uh, and I wanted to answer your question about the um, incumbents losing. Uh, you know, do we think we're going to lose any incumbents? What my, I mean, there's some really good uh, leaders. Uh, Chairman Cook has been the voice of reason throughout the whole session and the special session. So I hope we would not lose him. I hope he doesn't decide to retire because you still need some institutional knowledge uh, about the process and in the House, uh, whether, you know, Republican or Democrat, but it's good to have institutional knowledge. But I'll tell you this, the Freedom Caucus has been going around the floor saying, oh, we're going to have a mailer out on you on that. So, I mean, they're targeting incumbents, uh, you know, making note of every vote, making sure that every vote is recorded. So uh, a lot of people, I can tell, and to me, I, I don't think it's funny, but it's like, wow, I mean, I don't have that much pressure on me. But every vote that they take, they're taking notes and they're writing down their names. Right. Just like when Governor Abbott said, I want a list of people who support uh, my, my legislation and, and, and you better sign your name by Friday. I mean, this is the same tactics that they're doing coming right. after incumbents, trying to scare them more further right than what they really would be. So uh, I, do, I do see some targeted races that are gonna be coming out and we're gonna see some uh, turnover. Let Representative Roberts just answer that. Do you have a point of view about challenges to incumbent Republicans, Representative? First of all, Governor Abbott would be my answer. Huh. Yeah. Our candidate. Yeah. Um, do I have a view on incumbents? Yeah, I have an interesting view. Can I stand up? Sure, please. please. <laughs> uh, my view is this. I'm, I'm unique in that I truly believe that as representative, we should represent our constituents, okay? And I say unique to this extent. Um, every vote I take, it makes some of those in the political world happy, it makes some of those in the political world unhappy, okay? I think as it relates to incumbents, those who are truly listening to their community, who are voting based upon the interest and input of their community, they will be fine, because those are the folks that are going to the ballot box to vote. Now, that doesn't mean that all these machines on the outskirts will not come at them or come at you, okay? 
I'm starting to get a collection of nice little mail pieces with my name on it. But at the end of the day, I mean, I'm in the job, for example, as, as Ms. Collier and most and many of our representatives to represent their district. And that's all you can do. And I think if you do that, then the rest takes care of itself. Let's do it. We have time for one quick additional question. Woman in red. Thank you, Representative. In that regard, uh, there's a lot of growing diversity in Texas, and I represent one of those. I was just trying to see what we're doing in order to um, reach that diversity, and uh, you know, from the Texas Tribune or otherwise, and also encourage leadership or just report on other leaders as well. Thank you. Do you want to jump into that first? I heard a great quote this past Sunday, um, attending a church here, great church here in, in uh, Houston, and it was based upon community. And the quote was, if you don't like diversity now, you're not gonna like heaven. I mean, we are a diverse state. We are a diverse city. We are a diverse nation, okay? And I know that speaking for myself, I represent every constituent, okay? I reach out to the Democratic candidate that ran against me. And I ask, what are you hearing from those in your community? I will vote if 10 folks give me input on an issue, okay? Assuming that there's no unintended consequences, I will vote to represent those 10 individuals. So, you know, anybody that says we're not a diverse, that our districts aren't diverse, okay? Um, they're the ones that are gonna have trouble in re-elections because they have picked the comfort spot of their world to represent that. That may not be the view. Here's how I look at it. I represent real people with real issues. And that means everyone. Um, great question. Uh, I, I think that I, I, I'm just slightly, uh, I think that you're right about diversity. If you don't like it here, you won't like it in heaven. I think that's a fabulous quote. Uh, the only thing is that the way redistricting works is that they pack districts with the same type of people. So if you have a rural district, you're probably going to have a lot of Caucasian members or, or a lot of Latinos or, you know, I don't know, you'll have a lot of people that look like you in your district. My district is no different. I have a lot of African Americans in my district because it's been packed that way. And until we can fix redistricting, you're not going to see as much diversity uh, that's going around. Uh, I don't even know if there's that, maybe 10 flip districts in the whole. Um, maybe. Maybe how many? Maybe. Ten, maybe. 10 or 15. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe 10 or 15 flip that are, you know, 50, 51 or 48, you know, something like that. Mostly it's like I have a 78%, a 77% Democratic district. I'm sure you have a, a very large district as well. Uh, are you a safe district? 64% uh, Republican. So it's gonna be hard for a Republican, I'm a Democrat to come in there. But you know, he just said that, you said that you had the rebels as your, uh, did you guys use the Confederate flag too? Did you use the Confederate flag too? The little mascot on Okay, and is that still there? Okay, but they got rid of it because they don't wanna perpetuate the same type of bigotry and hate. And so that's what, that's what we need to do. We need to get rid of these things that remind people or make people feel like they have the right to do these things. Uh, you get rid of those uh, and then, you know, shame them back into their, their, their cubby holes or whatever. Um, so I think that, you know, we got to make sure that we move forward, not backwards uh, as we go uh, along in, in, in life. So I think that that's where we need to go. Great. Well, thank you. Well, that's all the time we have. Uh, if you like listening to the Tribcast every week, please do us a favor and uh, review us on iTunes. Also, this is important. We are accepting special guest introductions from our listeners. If you're so inclined, find a quiet place, record your own introduction on your phone, and send it to Tribcast at TexasTribune.org. Uh, bonus points if you're funny, we will put you on the air. Uh, please join me in giving a round of applause for our esteemed panelists. And thanks so much to our producers, Todd and Bobby. We are so glad you joined us. We'll be back on the airwaves next week. Thanks again. Thanks.